Good afternoon. As a land grant institution, we would first like to acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, that is the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands, where UCLA has the privilege to sit. My name is Nina Ponce, and I'm the director of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research and Professor um, and Fred W. and Pamela K. Wasserman Endowed Chair in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. The stark contrasts in LA's, LA County's preventable hospitalizations and emergency department visits. High rates of preventable hospitalization and emergency departments uh, in an area suggests that outpatient care isn't meeting the needs of the people living there. Inequities in access to and the quality of health care provided simply don't align with the health needs in these areas. Consequently, for conditions such as diabetes, asthma, hypertension, other conditions like bacterial pneumonia, urinary tract infections, dehydration, uh, people living with these manageable conditions end up seeking care in hospitals and emergency departments. In a new study by researchers at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, or CHPR, in partnership with our colleagues from Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital Center for Advancing Health Equity, we examined variations in rates of potentially preventable hospitalizations and emergency department visits. We examined these among adults living in Los Angeles County, looking at geographic variations across the county's eight service planning areas. Um, I'll be showing a map of that later. The disparities we found are a striking example of the healthcare system not properly serving the people who are made most vulnerable by medical and social conditions that they live in. Although it's not particularly surprising that the data show that people in lower income neighborhoods are more likely to end up in the hospital unnecessarily, but people, especially policymakers, should not become sensitized to these inequities. Today, joined by my co-author, Dr. Susan Babby, Senior Research Scientist and Co-Director of the Chronic Disease Program at the UCLA CHPR, we will share our research findings. If you're interested in today's slides, you can request them from our communications department at healthpolicy at ucla.edu. I'd also like to announce our next webinar on Thursday, May 16th. Um, thank you. We will host the Colorado Health Institute, or CHI, for a discussion on intersection between identity and data, disaggregating data in Colorado to understand behavioral health within the Hispanic or Latino community. During this presentation, CHI will share results from a research project funded by UCLA CHPR's Data Equity Center uh, to disaggregate data among the Hispanic and Latino community in order to understand access and utilization of behavioral health care in Colorado within this community. They will discuss a statistical approach to disaggregating data across multiple data systems in Colorado. Uh, our communications team will put the link, register in the chat, should you be interested. Col this is particularly um, exciting because Colorado is one of the states that has an all-payer data claims um, data ecosystem. So, so having survey data, uh, medical record data, claims data all in one and with the um, with the goal of data equity, I think it's going to be very exciting, and certainly California um, and other states could learn from the experience in Colorado. So I would like to begin this presentation with acknowledgments. First and foremost, I would like to thank to take a few minutes to thank and honor Dr. Ying Ying Meng, who passed away on April 11th. A member of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research team since 2000, Dr. Ying Ying Meng was director of research, 
co-director of the Chronic Disease Program with Dr. Susan Babby, and a senior research scientist. She also held an academic researcher appointment at the Department of Health Policy and Management at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Her research focused on the causes of and solutions to inequities in health and healthcare delivery from a holistic perspective. And she led pivotal studies on environmental health, air pollution, asthma, smoking behaviors, tobacco policies, and much more. She helped establish the center as a recognized source of important analysis of population-based data to understand complex web of a relationship between physical and social environments and chronic disease morbidity. Ying Ying was an extraordinary person whose distinguished career was surpassed only by her endless warmth and kindness. Her infectious smile and positive spirit lit up our center, inspiring all uh, of us who had the privilege to work alongside her. Beyond being a brilliant researcher, Ying Ying was a type of colleague who encouraged and championed all of us and a mentor, a very important, a mentor who treasured nurturing her mentees to become the next generation of public health scholars. She was instrumental in strengthening partnerships among the center's researchers and funders, um, researchers outside the centers, community-based organizations, um, and in particular, our partnership with the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital. And today's study would not have been possible without Ying Ying. We dedicate today's event to our beloved colleague. I would also like to thank the other researchers involved in this study at the UCLA um, CHPR. And we see the names there, including uh, Dr. Riti Shimkata, uh, senior research scientist, Dr. Shrikanth Kadiala, research scientist, and Sarah Steiger, Steiger's graduate student researcher. I'd like a call out to our research partners at MLK Community Hospital uh, Center for Advancing Health Equity, Crystal Lee Leo, um, Patrick Chen, um, Dr. Jorge Reno, and Dr. Elaine Bachelor, the CEO of MLK Community Healthcare. So let's now begin. So I'm going to start with um, the background of um, the study, and then we'll hand this off to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sue Babby, to talk about the methods and the results, and then they'll come back to me uh, to conclude and the policy recommendations. So the motivation of this study is that um, there's conditions, as I would mentioned, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, um, COPD, dehydration, and UTIs, urinary tract infections, that these conditions, um, if they're well managed, don't really need to um, be seen, you know, people don't need to be seen in an emergency uh, department visit or um, extended hospitalization because they can be prevented with proper disease management through um, routine visits to primary care providers and specialists and, um, and being advised well and taking medications as prescribed and also some lifestyle, lifestyle um, adjustments as well. Next slide. And when um, these manageable conditions then um, are treated in a hospital, in a hospital ED, and then um, and then the person is admitted, that it's very costly. So preventable hostel, hospitalizations um, are about three point five billion per year, and that's not in the United States. That's just in Los. That's just in California alone and uh, 2.5 to 10 times more than outpatient visits. In um, California, there are over 200,000 preventable hospitalizations in 2021, and more than a quarter of them, it's no surprise because LA County is um, about a quarter of the population in California, but more than a quarter are in Los Angeles County. Next slide. LA is um, the most populous county in the US. There's nearly 10 million residents. Um, it's split into eight service planning areas, and I'll show you a map in the next slide. 
Um, so spa ones, they've got spas, so spa one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and let's do the next slide to get a visual. You can see this. Um, this is LA County, the left is Pacific Ocean, um, right is uh, San Bernardino County, and south is Orange County, north is Ventura County. And um, the geographic differences here, we see the, the most north um, spa one is Antelope Valley. And um, where we are at UCLA um, is more coastal, so it's spa five. I think it's spa five, so we'll verify. Um, but spa six and spa one, so, so geolocate those because those are the two spas where we, um, we have um, um, some estimates that are alarming for these two spas. Next slide. And if I hand it over to Sue. Thank you, Ninez. I'm going to talk about our methods and uh, then our results. So we used hospital discharge and emergency department encounter data for Los Angeles County from the California Department of Healthcare Access and Information, um, also known as HCI. The data that we used were from 2016 through 2021. The hospital data consists of one record for each patient that is discharged from a California licensed hospital. The emergency department data includes one record for each patient who saw a provider at a California hospital that is licensed to provide emergency medical services. And there is no uh, duplication across these data sets. So hospital admissions from emergency departments are included in the hospital discharge, discharge data and excluded from the emergency department data. The hospital and emergency department data were used to calculate the rates of potentially preventable hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Visits or admissions for conditions are considered preventable if they are for a condition that typically will not result in a hospitalization or emergency department visit with proper disease management, which Minez um, referred to earlier. We calculated three rates of preventable admissions an overall rate, which includes all conditions for which visits could be prevented with appropriate disease management, a rate for chronic conditions, and a rate for diabetes-related conditions. We use the same conditions as those used by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, to calculate prevention quality indicators to identify the potentially preventable admissions. To obtain rates for each spa or service planning area, the number of potentially preventable hospitalizations or ED visits among patients 18 years or older was divided by the total number of adults 18 years or older within each spa. And the rates are per 100,000 adults for each service planning area. We also use data from the California Health Interview Survey to estimate the percentage of adults with health insurance through Medi-Cal for Los Angeles County service planning areas. CHIS is the largest uh, population-based state health survey. Each year, respondents from more than 20,000 households are interviewed from every county in the state, and the data are representative of the California population living in households. The survey asks about a wide range of health-related topics, including health insurance, access to health care, social and demographic characteristics, health status, conditions, and behaviors. Um, and Medi-Cal, I should mention, is a California's Medicaid program. Now I will talk about our results. So we found that South Los Angeles Spa 6 and Antelope Valley Spa 1 have the highest and second highest rates of potentially preventable hospitalizations and emergency department visits among Los Angeles's eight service planning areas. And West Los Angeles or Spa 5 has the lowest rates. So for example, the rate of potentially preventable hospitalizations for all conditions in South Los Angeles 
was 1,252 per 100,000 adults, followed by 888 in Antelope Valley, compared to 735 in West Los Angeles. This chart shows the rates of potentially preventable hospitalizations and emergency department visits by service planning area for all conditions and highlights in blue the areas with the highest rates in dark blue and the area with the lowest rate in light blue. So South Los Angeles Spa 6 and Antelope Valley Spa 1 had the highest and second highest rates of both preventable hospitalizations and preventable emergency department visits, whereas West Los Angeles Spa 5 had the lowest rate of preventable hospitalizations and preventable emergency department visits. And although this chart only shows the rates for all conditions, similar patterns were seen when looking at just, just chronic conditions as well as just diabetes-related conditions. As I mentioned um, earlier, we use the CHIS data to identify the percentage of adults in each spot who are covered by Medi-Cal insurance. Medi-Cal is California's Medicaid program, and it provides health insurance to Californians with limited income and resources. And although Medicaid recipients have, or Medi-Cal recipients have better access to care than adults without insurance, other research suggests that Medicaid recipients experience more barriers to accessing care relative to those with Medicare or with private health insurance. And we found when looking at the CHIS data that the percentage of adults insured by Medi-Cal varies across service planning areas within Los Angeles County, ranging from 10.7% in West Los Angeles to 27.9% in Antelope Valley and 35.2% in South Los Angeles. And we also looked at the relationship between uh, the rates of preventable hospitalizations and preventable emergency department visits and the percentage covered by Medi-Cal. And this chart shows that relationship. So not only does the percentage of adults insured by Medi-Cal vary by spa in Los Angeles County, but the service planning areas that had the highest rates of potentially preventable hospitalizations and potentially preventable emergency department visits are the same areas with the highest percentages of adults insured by Medi-Cal. So you can see on this chart that South Los Angeles or SPA 6 is way up in the um, right-hand corner, uh, followed by Antelope Valley over towards the right, and then the West LA area or SPA 5 is off on the left. So it was a little busy to actually show the values on the previous chart, but um, this graphic highlights the areas that had the highest and lowest rates of preventable hospitalizations and preventable emergency department visits for all conditions, as well as the percentages with Medi-Cal insurance. So <clears throat> as, uh, as I mentioned previously, South Los Angeles or SPA 6 had the highest rate of potentially preventable emergency department visits and hospitalizations, as well as proportion covered by Medi-Cal, Antelope Valley had the second highest rates. And West Los Angeles, or SPA 5, had the lowest rates of potentially preventable emergency department visits, potentially preventable hospitalizations, and the lowest percentage insured with Medi-Cal. Now I will hand it back to Nimez to talk about our conclusions and some recommendations. Thank you, Sue. So this, this study is just simply a report card of LA County and um, really nothing fancy, but putting together um, population data from CHIS and, and data on um, hospital admissions, ED admissions from HPI, uh, and mapping this. There are some studies that look at 
higher levels at the county level, comparing counties, comparing states, but not at the granular level of within the county, within our neighborhoods. And the conclusions is are, you know, what you saw, what 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 uh, Dr. Babby showed is that Spa Six, South Los Angeles, um, and Spa One, Antelope Valley, um, have higher rates of this measure of preventable hospitalizations, preventable ED visits, and that is an indictment of um, outpatient care not meeting the needs of those living in those areas, and it is no surprise or. It should actually not be a surprise, but that there's also then equities might be driven by the source of coverage because in those same spas, spa six and spa one, there are higher percentages of adults of people that are um, insured by Medi-Cal. And um, there's a ton of research that shows that Medi-Cal recipients um, may be experiencing more barriers to accessing care. Um, not all, not all the time, because there's no co-pays in Medi-Cal, for example, certainly better than those who are uninsured in many cases, but that there, um, there have been documented, um, documented barriers um, in several studies. And, and so access to quality primary care service that can manage your asthma, your diabetes, that could be preventable um, and that you don't have to go to you know, go to an emergency room for acute cases and you don't have to be hospitalized, that we're certainly seeing, again, this is just a cross-section report card that there are geographic disparities in one county, in our county, Los Angeles. Next slide. So what are you going to do about it? Next slide. <clears throat> well, it's, you know, we want to improve access to primary and specialty care. And um, building up outpatient care, uh, the access and quality is an essential ingredient of reducing rates of preventable hospitalizations and ED visits. Um, how do you do that? You can have the insurers or payers or decision makers who make allocation decisions on the inputs to our healthcare system to allocate to primary care, you know, invest more in primary care. You can invest, or policymakers can invest in new health centers. Federal government can invest in new health centers, the um, federally qualified health clinics, federally designated shortage areas. There's measures of this, and certainly our study can inform you know, areas of investment. Um, so targeting these areas to build up primary and outpatient specialty care. And provider organizations then could establish, so in terms of within organization quality improvement could establish ongoing um, continuity of care that's so important, um, clinical relationships. So it's not just about treating people um, at that point of contact, particularly, particularly those who are uninsured or um, with Medi-Cal, but to ensure that there's continuity, that there's connections to the health system, that we think about um, uh, this notion of whole person care and not just what's happening. Um, in, within the clinic walls, but also in the, the wider social safety net. Next slide, please. But often it's about incentives and money and um, how much you pay uh, for Medicaid. So there's higher Medicaid reimbursement rates are associated with better access to um, health care. And there's variations across the states in the U.S. because there's um, each state may have um, different reimbursement rates. And in a recent um, look from Kaiser Family Foundation of ranking the states, um, that California ranks 32nd in the nation. If you think about the uh, Medicaid to Medicare fee index, that means that uh, Medi-Cal, our Medicaid program in California, pays 73 cents to every dollar paid to Medicare providers. And that investment ranks 32nd. The good news is that as of January, 2024, that this, um, the payment to Medicaid reimbursement was raised um, to no less than 87.5 cents to the Medicare dollar. Um, and this is, increasing rates, but not for all services, but for some services, primary care, obstetric, 
um, and non-specialty mental health services. So this is a step in the right direction, but it certainly is not at parity with the Medicare rate. Um, improving pay payments to healthcare providers um, can help attract and retain skilled professionals. And I think that that's, uh, there's studies on that. And then I think there's just logic and common sense um, in, um, in how payments incentivize then the attraction and retention to not only you know, serving in healthcare, but serving certainly in areas um, where the need is high. Next slide. Oh, and that's it. So building the, the primary care um, system, specialty care, and then the payment reform in those areas, I think two big hunks you know, of, of policies that can be done to um, bolster and improve the primary care system, outpatient system, particularly in the areas of SPA um, 6, just South Los Angeles, and SPA 1, Antelope Valley. And um, you know, with these investments, um, we're hoping then that uh, if we did a follow-up study, we would show that it would reduce these geographic inequities that we presented to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ponce. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tiffany Lopes, and I'm the Director of Communications here at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. I'm going to be going through uh, audience questions, so please uh, use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask them, and we'll get to as many as we can. So one of the first questions we have is, um, how do you define uh, a preventable um, ED visit? So um, an, a preventable ED visit was defined as any emergency department visit for uh, one of several conditions that are considered to be um, conditions that should not result in um, emergency care or hospitalization, assuming that um, appropriate disease management and um, care is provided for an individual with that condition. So things like asthma, diabetes, uh, COPD, urinary tract infection. Thank you. Were there any other criteria for this classification? Um, well, we the, the specific conditions that we used were uh, taken from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, um, and they're the same conditions that ARC uses uh, in producing their prevention quality indicators. So still along that those lines of questions, uh, somebody asked if dental emergency department visits uh, were included in preventable emergency department visits that we looked at. Yeah, I, that's a good question. And um, dental visits were not um, on that list of conditions, so they were not included. Thank you. For the spas, um, are the populations roughly similar for each? Um, no, I, I don't know the population sizes off the top of my head, but um, but I do know that they vary quite a bit. Um, and Antelope Valley, for example, uh, is a much more rural area in general and has a um, smaller population than uh, most of the other spas. Thank you. But, the, but maybe, Sue, so you can talk about the organization I mean, it's not just simply dividing because LA County is large, but it's a way of our department as a public health response. Um, so I think that there are some commonalities within um, the areas within a spa. And for example, the West Side, you know, may have more, um, more healthcare services availability and access um, than, than South LA. So yeah, and Los way. Angeles yeah. County um, uses those areas to uh, help with their planning for service delivery and um, public health programs as well. Yeah, I'll put the, the link from LA County, Public Health. Thank you. Um, do we know if there's a discrepancy in percentage of PCPs in the spas who accept Medicaid? So 
we don't have, we did not have that particular data for this analysis. Um, I think there is some anecdotal evidence that our colleagues at MLK Community Healthcare have shared with us, suggesting that this may be the case, but we don't have um, that specific data um, at this point. But yeah, that's that's a really good question because that would be very interesting data to have. Definitely. Did you look into access to telehealth as a factor to higher emergency department visits? Also, is there data to show that older adults are more at risk for preventable emergency department visits? So we, in this uh, study, we did not look into um, the telehealth aspect. Um, I think that is an interesting question that uh, would be worth pursuing in the future to see whether telehealth, um, you know, may may help uh, address some um, access to care issues that areas could be experiencing. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, is there data to show that older adults are more at risk for preventable emergency department visits? Mm. Um, so we did we did actually look at these data by um, stratified by age, and I'm trying to remember. I believe that older adults did have higher rates of um, preventable emergency department visits, um, although older adults in general have higher rates of emergency department visits and hospitalizations overall. So I think it's not necessarily surprising that they have higher rates of preventable visits as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I mean, once you start dealing with older adult health, um, it gets more complicated and it's a little harder to know the extent to which hospitalizations and emergency department visits are completely preventable um, because the health is more complex to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, uh, Dr. Elaine Batchelor posted in the chat for folks who haven't seen that there's uh, more analyses are coming um, and they're great questions that we may be able to explore. So um, keep those coming. Uh. Can you? I, I also just want to acknowledge some of the comments uh, that looks heartening um, by uh, Nicholas Hamilton about a, a proposition on maybe uh, increasing Medi-Cal reimbursement some more, and but by Naina Harawa, my colleague, thank hello uh, about a REACH UCLA program um, to you know increase UCLA's role uh, in. Um, reducing these disparities. So definitely there. Knowledge um, that we are among colleagues who really care about um, the inequities here. Absolutely. And there are some good uh, resources in the chat for uh, folks. If you uh, are not able to capture everything, you can email us at healthpolicy at ucla.edu and we can send um, the chat with all the links over to you. Can you estimate the costs of the preventable hospital and emergency department visits that you found? Um, policymakers often respond to dollars. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> that is yeah. definitely true. Go ahead. Nina. Well, Will, that was from Will Nicholas. Um, yes. We're happy to do this with <laughs> um, more funding to do that study. But yes, we could. But we did not do this. This is like the first stage of, as I said, a report card of what's going on in LA County. And on the topic of uh, more funding, um, are there any plans to dig even deeper than the service planning areas to look at some of the communities uh, within those spas, especially for South Los Angeles and Antelope Valley? Yeah, so actually in our um, policy brief, we included a map that shows the rates of preventable hospitalizations at the zip code level, um, and you do see uh, significant um, clusters of zip codes, particularly in areas of South Los Angeles. I think almost all of that spa is uh, has zip codes with some of the highest rates, but there are also clusters within other spas 
um, that even spas that didn't have, you know, overall the highest rates of preventable hospitalizations. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, um, that was really promulgated getting at the more granular level by our, our late colleague, Ying Yingma, you know, getting at the zip code level analysis. Thank you. Was Cal AIM and the increased focus on enhanced care management and community supports looked at as a realistic approach to addressing concerns? Payment rates are still so low for organizations providing ACM. We did not specifically look at that. Um, certainly just the, the broader general recommendation on payment reform, but um, but it is, you know, again, something as Dr. Bachelor said, there's more to come and these questions actually are helping inspire us on then what, how to triage like the next, you know, the next steps for this analysis. Thank you. Is it possible that the length of insurance coverage could influence the data we're seeing here? For example, could someone who only recently became eligible for Medicaid have lower slash higher risk for preventable emergency department visits compared to someone who has had Medicaid for longer? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, our our population-based estimate of Medicaid coverage from CHIS was um, current coverage, but we can certainly dig deeper in the data. And there is a question on, um, on duration of coverage, whether you switched, uh, you know, going from uninsured to Medicaid, uh, commercial to Medicaid. So the kind of um, discontinuity of coverage, which of course everybody's worried about with Medicaid unwinding, um, that that is something I, I'd imagine without doing the analysis that um, there's going to be some differences depending on how you got to Medicaid, where you went from uninsured to Medicaid or commercial to Medicaid, um, or whether perhaps like continuity in Medicaid gave you navigational skills of establishing that rapport that we had mentioned in, in our recommendation one with their provider. Thank you. Does insufficient managed care plan network capacity influence preventable hospital burden? Hmm. I mean, that's not something that we specifically looked at here, um, but it seems plausible that it could. <laughs> yeah, network adequacy, Dr. Shaw, I think that was Naman Shah's question, is, uh, you know, certainly a, a, this concern um, of having um, adequate networks, and accessible, really important because the managed care penetration is, oh, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it's gotta be like north of you know, 50, 60% for Medicaid. Then it it's- was uh, higher than that. Even. Yeah, way north, okay, much <laughs> higher. Um, then that would be you know, what we're showing, but we didn't, we didn't distinguish whether it was managed care or not in Medicaid, but if most, Wait, no, so we did talk about this because we were thinking about what about the managed care piece? Um, oh, oh, and I see right. uh, Nina Nina Harawa put in the chat that is 99%. <laughs> well, see, it is. So what you saw was managed care. Thank you, Nina. Has there been any comparison between preventable hospitalization numbers before and after the implementation of the ACA? Um, that is a Good question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Do you, do you know Nina's? No, I don't know. I suspect it's more favorable now because one of the features of the ACA um, was uh, the annual preventive visit that would be free without co-pays to the patient. So um, our trend analysis of CHIS data shows increase on um, preventive routine, preventive visit, um, annual visits, you know, post um, 2014. 
So HCA was 2010, and then a lot of the rollout um, was 2014. So looking at you know pre-2014 and post, that we do see this upward trend of preventive visit, um, for ag routine annual visit. Yeah, and I think also um, for having a usual source of care, there has been research showing that the um, people were more likely to have a usual source of care post ACA. Um, so that could also contribute to better um, access to care. But yeah, I don't know if that exact study has been done. Thank you. Besides the chronic conditions described for preventable hospitalizations, um, and this is again on the clinical criteria, were there any clinical criteria considered for the pre preventable determination, for example, severity of the condition? Yeah, in, in this analysis, um, severity of the condition uh, was, was not um, part of the criteria. It was any, any admission or visit for um, those conditions that typically shouldn't require emergency care or hospitalization. Thank you. We've got one more question um, left. So if folks do have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A or chat and we will get to them. Um, a significant Medi-Cal is default assigned, um, i.e. member is not choosing and hence unengaged in their healthcare due to multiple individual priorities, social determinants of health, education, et cetera. How do you engage those? That is a good question. <laughs> um, so Sue I and I are not clinicians, uh, <laughs> but I think the engagement, it's true. I mean, it, it, you're, there's a default assignment of primary care. Um, and that's why one of our recommendations was more in the onus of the provider um, in um, as the onus is on them to establishing the relationship with the patient um, and uh, screening for social determinants of health and possibly the referrals for you know for housing for uh, to address food insecurity um, and I think there's a lot of population health folks here um, in the room that are looking into you know, different programs from their healthcare systems. So I think that they're very well aware of that patient engagement is important and patient engagement to address not just the um, not just the medical needs um, that makes a person vulnerable, but also the social needs. But you, our center also does the, uh, um, and I think my colleague and and the, the team is here in the room, uh, evaluation of whole person care. And so they're like, stay tuned for their webinar um, and looking at kind of this, the different ways of more interoperable, integrated systems in taking care of the patient. Definitely. Are there plans to assess the accessibility and utilization of urgent care, particularly those urgent cares that participate in multiple Medi-Cal plans and the relationship between urgent care utilization to, av to avoidable ER visits? That was a long question. It was what? a long question. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and is it written? <laughs> it, is, it is written. It, this one's in the chat. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Do you want me to read it again? I, I'm looking at it. Um, okay. Yeah, actually, and, and Dr. Batchelor just put in the chat um, exactly what I was thinking, which is, I don't know of a source for um, urgent care data. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, we, we didn't have, we don't have that specific plan. I think it, the question makes a lot of sense because People often go to urgent care when they're trying to avoid, you know, going to an emergency department, but they still feel like they need to see someone um, very soon. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure I know how we would um, assess that. 
and then I also just want to direct folks to the chat um, about the, the the question related to the ACA. Um, and uh, Gwen Dobson wrote there, I believe, thirty day hospital readmission rates declined after the ACA. Um, so there there are quite a few little nuggets um, in the chat for folks. Okay, just uh, one more question. I know I said that a few minutes ago, but if anybody else has any questions, um, go ahead and drop them in. Um, any notable differences by category of preventable events? Um, diabetes, asthma, anything else? Mm. That is a good question. And I think we, we have- no, I, thought, I thought we had a diabetes specific. We do. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to remember the the same pattern held across the um, the sort of combined uh, categories of preventable visits and admissions, um, where South Los Angeles and Antelope Valley had the first, the highest and second highest rates, and West Los Angeles had the lowest rate. Um, but I cannot remember if there was any, when we looked at like the individual condition um, rates, if anything stood out. We do we have are, data, we could go back. We and have the data, we're thinking of doing this for um, a further study or for a peer reviewed study. Yeah. So but I we'll, do recall looking at diabetes and the patterns were very similar. Yeah. And diabetes could be the driver of this as well. Thank you. Uh, Will, if you uh, want to email us um, at healthpolicy at ucla.edu, we will get you uh, that response uh, via email. Yes, and, and, and Dr. Bachelor just confirmed we have uh, um, this this uh, this compact policy brief was <laughs> was pages and pages and pages of analysis. I wanted to thank the LLK folks on um, uh, on all the geospatial analysis, the linkage, you know, turning the data upside down, all all of that in the discussions. Um, but we landed on you know doing this as a first um, look at the geographic disparities, and certainly it's as we're seeing here in this um, in this webinar today. It's it's um, inspiring, you know, further delving into this data that to be linked with specific policy reforms. Definitely, and um, I don't know if you saw, but there's another um, kind of question slash offer in the chat. Could we partner with the urgent care centers in our area? I'm not sure if they would be willing to share their data, um, visits, LOS, calls to EMS, referrals to ED, et cetera. I really like that. I don't know Anna Hayes, but want to get to know Anna Hayes <laughs> for that suggestion. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. And someone else said LA Care and HCAs, any utilization management should have data on urgent care utilization. Yeah. Yeah. I think the question is if they would be willing to um, share the data. <laughs> I don't think that there's anyone in the in the room right now who could answer that. But if you're there, again, email us. Um, and then just one last comment. Um, from someone uh, uh, that says, agree about social drivers, uh, cultural linguistic barriers and health literacy as partly driving emergency department visits. Since social determinants of health data is beginning to be gathered, it will be fascinating to revisit at some point in the future. Yeah, absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are all the questions we have, and I think it's a great way to end it. I just want to thank you all again for joining us for today's event. Uh, we will be posting the recording of it on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Um, if you would like a copy of today's uh, presentation, so the PowerPoint, you can email us at healthpolicy at ucla.edu. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.